Hello. I find that some of my students have a bit of an intuition gap about the chain rule. They can often remember the formula and use it, but they don't really have a very good grasp of what it's really saying and why it's true. So I want to explore that in this video, explore why that's true and um, what we can do about it. So we often see the chain rule in this form, which is quite a perplexing and complicated formula, um, particularly this f dashed of g of x business. Um, I think, I, looking back at my own school days, I think I found that a bit puzzling when I first met it. Of course, we also meet it in this form, which is beguilingly simple and actually rather conceals what it's really all about, which is that we're trying to find the derivative of the composition of two functions um, and relate that to the derivatives of the two functions. So I'm going to explore that using four different ways of thinking about functions and their derivatives. In the previous video, I talked about three different ways of thinking about functions, but there is a fourth I like to use. In that video is already quite long, and I didn't think the fourth view added much to it there, but it does to this one, so I'm going to use all four. So the first is the formula. Uh, so a function is something which produces an output when you present it with an input, and the formula just does just tells you what the calculation is inside the formula. Um, the second is the graph, which displays all the values. So for every x in the domain, we plot the point x, f of x in the xy plane. And that gives a very nice view of what the function is really doing. The third view is the function machine. Um, now, function machines are not much good at analysing individual functions because all function machines look the same. Um, but it's very good at uh, looking at function theory in general. I've recently decided the function machines really ought to go right to left, so I'm going to try you on that. Now, the fourth view, then, when we learn about functions and mappings and domains and ranges and all that sort of stuff, we sometimes draw pictures like this. And, of course, if I were going right, I'd do it that way. But actually, I'm going to do it differently again. So these things really, we're not talking about real functions or real variable thing always. So this here is, these are both copies of the real line. So I'm going to display it this way. And I call this the mapping view. So we have an arrow wrap running from each point in the domain to the corresponding point in the range. And that does display a function quite nicely, probably not as nicely as the graph, but there are some other merits to this way of thinking about it. OK, so now let's think about differentiation. Starting with the formula view, well, this is where we do the first principle stuff. We define the derivative this way. We can use that to prove a formula for f dashed of x from the formula for x. And so, for example, this is where we prove that the derivative of x to the n is nx to the n minus 1, and later that the derivative of sine x is cos x. And we can here prove the product rule and the quotient rule and the chain rule, but I'm going to come on to that. OK, problem with this view, of course, is that there's really no visualisation involved. So it's quite poor at giving students an intuition about differentiation. So we turn to the graph. So here's the, the, the differentiation. This is a lovely view of differentiation. So here we do, uh, we show how the gradient of a chord tends to the gradient of a tangent. Uh, we talk about change in y over change in x. We can relate that to the first principles definition, and it all looks very pretty. And you get a very good idea of what differentiation is for. Also, uh, it reminds us that the derivative is itself a function in that the derivative varies depending on x. So that's all very nice. Now, what about function machine differentiation? This is really interesting, actually. Um, so we're talking about what happens to the output of a function machine when we change the input just a little tiny bit. So the first thing you have to say is that it has to be a fairly well-behaved function if the input, if when the input changes a little bit, the output only changes a little bit too. So we call that continuity. Um, and, uh, well, this view makes it obvious that actually continuity is a real condition here. It's not going to be true for most functions. It's quite a strong condition. Students can get away with the intuition that functions are always continuous because, after all, if you write a formula down, it's going to be a continuous function, um, except at perhaps at vertical asymptotes. Um, and if you sketch a curve, well, it's going to be a continuous curve, isn't it? So it's quite easy to think that functions are going to be, um, are going to be continuous. But this, clear, this view makes it clear that actually continuity is a real condition that not all functions will satisfy. In fact, we've got to go much further than that. We've got to have a very well-behaved function so that the change in the output will be approximately proportional to the change in the input. Well, why on earth would that be true? Um, in fact, it's pretty obvious that that's a very strong condition and mostly won't be true. Um, so differentiability is a strong condition. Most functions are not differentiable. Um, well, we can relate to the graph view and see how well, if there's a 
gradient of a chord tending to the gradient of a tangent, well, then this will be true. Um, so anyway, in order to be able to uh, analyse differentiation, we do have to assume that that's true, that the change in the output will be approximately change, proportional to change in the input, right this way. So, and then we call the constant of proportionality the derivative. So the change in f of x is uh, approximately f dash to x times the change in x. So we can write that that way using the delta notation, and we then turn that into that. And that we can relate to both the formula definition, the first principles definition, and also to the change in y over change in x um, thing about the graphical view. So that's all really quite nice. Um, now, what about derivatives using the mapping. This is really rather interesting too. So we're talking again about what happens if we change the input a little bit. Well, let's change the input a little bit and see what happens. Uh, there it is. The output changes, of course. Um, and we're talking about the derivative then is going to be the ratio between the little change at this end and the little change at that end. And there's a rather nice way to think about that. If we sweep the input across the domain at unit velocity, then the derivative is the velocity of the arrow, arrowhead. Rather nice, isn't it? So here we can see the derivative is positive. It's slowing down. The arrowhead is stationary at the stationary point, and it goes backwards where the derivative is negative. Then it's stationary at another stationary point, and then it's forwards again. Um, so the derivative is the velocity of the head of the arrow, given the tail of the arrow is moving at um, constant velocity 1, or alternatively, it's the velocity of the head of the arrow divided by the velocity of the tail of the arrow. That's quite a nice way to visualise differentiation. In fact, of course, if this, is, um, if this is time and this is position, so that this function is recording where some particle is at time t, then of course dx by dt is velocity. Right, so that's really quite pretty. Um, now, let's move on to the chain rule. So taking the formula view of the chain rule is a bit of a nightmare, to be honest. Look at this thing. So what's going on here? So we're trying to find the derivative of the composition of two functions. So by definition, that's this. We take that fg thing, evaluate it at x plus h, and subtract the evaluation at x and divide by h. Uh, well, by definition of fg, that's this. So we expand fg to mean f of g of. And then we play this trick uh, where we multiply top and bottom by this thing here, g of x plus h minus g of x, which I'm going to call the middle difference. Um, and then we say, well, the limit of this product is the product of the limits. That's quite a sophisticated step. And then we look at these two halves and say, well, this one is obviously g, of g dash of x. That's easy. This one is not so obviously anything at all, but it is in fact f dash of g of x. And you can see that because this is f of g of x. This is f of g of x plus a little bit. Well, it is if g is continuous anyway. And this is um, the little bit because it's that minus that. So this does indeed tend to f dash of g of x. Now, as I see it, there are three problems with this um, proof. Uh, one is... Well, we've got this business of passing from the limit of the product to the product of limits. Well, actually, that's fairly easy to fix. I'm not going to focus on that. We'll, we'll move that one out of the way. Um, the other pro Well, the main problem, really, is that you can't work out what's going on. It's complicated, and there's no intuitive grasp of it, I don't think. It doesn't give you an intuitive feel for what this chain rule is really doing. Most people need a picture. A picture's worth a thousand words. Um, the other problem, of course, is what if this middle difference is zero? Well, this whole proof collapses in a heap on the floor. Um, does that mean the form, the chain rule isn't true uh, in possessional cases? Or is it just a problem for the proof that this proof needs fixing up? I don't think this approach really gives you an intuitive feel for that, for the answer to that question. So anyway, in order to get some sort of grasp, intuitive grasp of it, we turn to the, we turn, um, to the graph. <clears throat> Well, the problem with the graph is that it's hopeless at composition. There's really no helpful way of thinking about what the graph of fg is going to look like by staring at the graph of f and the graph of g. Still less what the derivative of fg is. So we can't expect much from the graph in terms of intuition about the chain rule. We can get something, though. Um, I've seen pictures like this, which are quite complicated still, but um, not impossible. So this is g of x. Um, here's an x and here's an x plus h. Um, and here are the, the function values. 
And if we just focus on that right hand graph, if h tends to zero, then you can see the graph, that the, the gradient of the uh, chord tending to the gradient of the tangent, and that's g dashed of x. So that's quite nice. And over here, well, this is the graph of f, and we're feeding it g values, g output values. So here's g of x, and this is g of x plus h, and these are the f values of those g values. And now, um, if h tends to zero, you can see um, that chord there tending to a tangent, and the gradient of that tangent is indeed f dashed evaluated at g of x. So that's quite nice. It does show you that. And in fact, you can relate that to the formula because it's in the formula we get that minus that over that minus that. So that is f dashed of g of x. That's quite nice. The problem with this presentation, of course, is the, the composition is nowhere to be seen. Where is fg and what's its gradient? Well, its gradient is the limit of that length over that length. And that's not a lot of help, really, is it? OK, so let's try the, the function machine. And this really is help, because function machines are really good at composition. So here's a composition of two function machines. We take x and we feed it into g. We take its output g and feed it into f, and its output is f of g of x. We put a function machine box around all that, and we call it fg. And that's why I want my function machines running right to left, of course, so that fg comes out in the right order. So for fg, the input is x, and its output is, of course, by definition, fg of x, but that's just a relabeling of f of g of x. OK, now let's talk about the derivatives. So g of x is the limiting, g dashed of x is the limiting ratio of a small change here to a small change here. And f dashed of x is the limiting ratio of a small change here to a small change here. And f g dashed is the limiting ratio of a small change here to a small change here. Well, that's great because that ratio is obviously that one times that one. That over that is that over that times that over that. So that makes it very clear that the derivative of the composition is the product of the derivatives. But wait, um, these derivatives are themselves functions, and we have to evaluate them at the right place. So g in this picture is being evaluated at x, and therefore g dash must be. And fg is also being evaluated at x, so fg dash must be. f, however, is being evaluated at g of x, and so f dash must be. So there we are. So that's very pretty, I think. So the, the function machine view makes it, I think, pretty clear that um, the, function, the derivative of the composition is the product of the derivatives and explains this f dashed of g of x thing really nicely. OK, now what about using the mapping view? Uh, this is the star of the show, really, because mappings are not only good at displaying individual functions, but they're also really good at compositions. So here's a composition of two functions. Right, so let's look at the derivative here. If we sweep this input along uh, point along at velocity 1, then the velocity of the top red arrowhead is, of course, g dashed of x. That's that one. The velocity of the black arrowhead is f g dashed of x. Now, the velocity of the bottom red arrowhead is the velocity of this one, that's g dashed of x, times f dashed but of course evaluated at g of x. And of course the black arrowhead and the bottom red arrowhead are in the same place. And so we have fg dashed of x is g dashed of x times f dashed of g of x. So that's quite nice. So you can actually see uh, the, f the chain rule in action here. I like that view. Um, OK, so that's it really as far as looking at the function machine, except that I've glossed over that middle difference problem. We need to go back and look at that. Um, actually, it doesn't jump out at you using the mapping, that, that using the function machine. Um, with that view, you can easily f not notice that problem. And you don't really notice it here either. Um, so let's go back to the formula um, and see how we're going to tackle this. So... It's not going to be a problem if this thing is only occasionally zero, because you can miss those values out. Once h gets small enough, it won't be zero again, and then this proof will work. So the only problem is going to be at some value of x, for which this middle difference is repeatedly zero, as h tends to zero. That's going to be a pretty strange function, isn't it? In fact, you know, don't you, really, that it's going to be a function like this. So here is a function where um, that middle difference is repeatedly zero because 
the val as you tend toward as h tends towards zero, the value of the function is repeatedly equal to its value at zero here. And of course, that does imply that the derivative itself is zero, assuming it is differentiable. Okay, so let's look at that. So this this is a bit messy, I admit, but this is that very function um, here displayed as in the mapping view. And now let's look at the derivative. So as we approach that critical point, we see the top red arrow oscillating back and forth and getting smaller and smaller and faster and faster. And when you get pretty close, you can hardly see it moving, really. Which means, of course, yeah, the derivative zero there. And then it starts wobbling around again and off it goes again. But price, precisely because we've seen that that red arrow head um, has velocity zero instantaneously around here, it follows that the, the bottom red arrow head has velocity zero as well. Uh, and therefore, the black arrow head does. So the chain rule is going to be true in this case because um, g dashed of x is zero and so is fg dashed. So that means we really ought to be able to fix this up. So now if we go back to the formula, we see we can fix it up. There are several ways to fix it up, but my favourite view, my favourite approach is to divide this into two cases. So we'll take, first of all, those x for which g dashed of x is non-zero. In that case, um, this middle differencing is ultimately non-zero. This thing tends to a non-zero limit, so it can't keep being zero. In which case, this proof works perfectly. So that shows you that this is equal to that. OK, now suppose g dashed is zero. Well, the nice thing about that is we can forget about this thing. All we've got to do is prove that this thing tends to zero. Um, OK, so we've got an x for which g dashed of x is zero. So for those h now for which this is non-zero, this proof is still working. And because this is zero, that limit is therefore zero. For those h for which this is zero, well, this is zero because that's equal to that. So either, so for those h for which um, this is non-zero, this is tending to zero. And for those h for which this is zero, it is zero. So either way, this limit is zero. So, yeah, the proof works. The proof can be fixed, and the, fun and the chain rule really is true. So that's nice. Uh, now, let's just look at summarise then. Uh, so, four views of the chain rule. The formula is the way you do proof. There's no other way to do it. It's, it's the formal definition of differentiation and how you prove things. Um, but very poor on visualisation and intuition, therefore. Um, the graph is excellent at viewing of uh, excellent view of differentiation but hopeless at composition and therefore really not much use in this context but it does explain this bit quite nicely f dash to g of x the function machine is good at composition but hopeless at individualizing individual functions it raises these issues of continuity and differentiability which is worth having and it also explains uh, very nicely why um, the product the derivative of the composition is the product of the derivatives and why f dash to g of x appears Finally, the mapping view is good at individual functions and composition, so you can really see the, the chain rule happening. Um, and it gives you an intuition that the middle difference issue is not fatal and can be fixed up, and then you go back to the formula view to fix it. So there we are. I hope that helps.